title, The Guest in Room 37. It was late September when Sarah decided to take a solo road trip to clear her head. Life in the city had become too suffocating, and the open road promised a much-needed escape. She drove until dusk, her car cutting through the winding roads of rural Pennsylvania, with the golden hues of sunset fading into the cool, purple tones of night. As darkness settled in, she realized she had no destination in mind, no place to stay. Spotting a small, flickering neon sign on the side of the road that read Evergreen Motel, she pulled in. The motel was a relic of the 1960s, with peeling paint and a cracked parking lot. But it was quiet, and at that moment, that was all Sarah wanted. Inside the small lobby, a bell jingled as she entered. The man behind the counter looked up, his face shadowed under the dim light. His age was indiscernible, somewhere between 40 and 60, but his eyes were sharp, almost too sharp. He smiled at Sarah, revealing crooked teeth. Evening, how can I help you? He asked in a gravelly voice. Just need a room for the night, Sarah replied, forcing a polite smile. Only got one room left, room 307. It's at the end of the hall, upstairs, quietest room we have. Sarah nodded and handed over her credit card. The man swiped it slowly, spaced her eyes never leaving hers. You'll have a good night's rest, he said, almost as if it were a command. He handed her the key, an actual brass key with a faded green tag. Just you tonight? Yes, just me, Sarah answered, suddenly feeling a little uneasy under his gaze. If you need anything, I'm always here, he added, his smile widening in a way that made Sarah's skin crawl. She took the key and hurried to her room, trying to shake off the unsettling vibe. The hallway was long and poorly lit, with a musty smell hanging in the air. Room 307 was indeed at the end of the hall, far from any other occupied rooms, though the motel seemed mostly empty. The room itself was clean but outdated, with faded floral wallpaper and a creaky bed. A small TV sat on a dresser, its screen dark. Sarah locked the door behind her, securing the deadbolt and the chain, then sat on the bed to collect her thoughts. She glanced at the nightstand where a Bible rested. Beside it, a laminated card listed the motel's amenities, or lack thereof. The night was silent, almost unnaturally so. Sarah turned on the TV for some background noise, but the static-filled channels only added to the eerie atmosphere. Eventually, she turned it off, deciding to read instead. But as she reached for her book, a strange sound made her pause. It was a soft shuffling, like feet dragging across the carpet outside her door. Sarah's heart began to race as she listened. The sound stopped right in front of room 307. She held her breath, waiting, but nothing happened. After a few moments, she convinced herself it was just another guest, perhaps lost, and tried to focus on her book. Minutes passed, and just as Sarah's heartbeat returned to normal, she heard it again. The shuffling. This time, it was followed by a faint knock on her door. Three slow, deliberate taps. She froze, staring at the door, her mind racing. Who could it be? The desk clerk? Another guest? Her hand inched toward her phone, but she hesitated. She didn't want to seem paranoid, but the knocking continued, persistent and slow, like someone trying to be polite but not wanting to leave. Finally, she crept to the door and peered through the peephole. At first, she saw nothing but darkness. Then, she realized there was something, or someone, standing there, almost blending into the shadows. It was a figure, tall and thin, with long, lank hair obscuring its face. The person, or thing, stood motionless, facing her door. Sarah's breath caught in her throat. She backed away from the door, her hands shaking. This couldn't be real. Maybe it was some kind of prank. But as the knocking grew louder and more insistent, panic set in. She dialed the front desk, her fingers trembling. The phone rang several times before the clerk answered, his voice calm and unhurried. Front desk. How can I help you? There's someone outside my room, Sarah whispered urgently. They've been knocking and won't leave. Can you please come check? There was a pause on the other end. Then the clerk spoke, his voice disturbingly calm. Are you sure? There's no one else checked in tonight. Sarah's blood ran cold. What do you mean? I'm telling you, someone's outside my door right now. The clerk chuckled softly. Miss, there hasn't been a guest in room 307 for years. That room's not supposed to be occupied. Her heart pounded in her chest as his words sank in but I'm in 307 right now. Then I suggest you leave quickly, he replied, his voice dropping to a menacing whisper. She doesn't like visitors. Before Sarah could respond, the line went dead. Panic overwhelmed her. 
She grabbed her bag, intent on leaving immediately, but the moment she turned back to the door, the knocking stopped. Silence filled the room, thick and suffocating. She steeled herself and reached for the doorknob, but as she touched it, the door slowly creaked open on its own. There, in the doorway, stood the figure, its head slowly lifting to reveal a pale, gaunt face, eyes hollow and black. Sarah screamed and stumbled backward, but the figure remained in the doorway, unmoving. Then, in a voice that sounded like a dry whisper, it spoke. You're in my room. The lights flickered, and before Sarah could react, the figure lunged at her, its cold, bony hands wrapping around her throat. She struggled, gasping for air, but her strength was no match for the icy grip. Darkness closed in as she desperately fought for her life. The next morning, the desk clerk whistled to himself as he cleaned the lobby. The motel was empty, as usual. He glanced at the keys behind him and noticed that the key for room 307 was missing. A smile tugged at the corner of his mouth. He walked up to room 307, opened the door, and found it just as he expected, empty. Save for the faint outline of a body on the bed, as if someone had slept there for years. Shaking his head, he closed the door and locked it, placing the key back on its hook. She always gets what she wants, he muttered, before returning to the front desk, ready to check in the next unfortunate guest. Unfortunate. Title, The Mirror Room. Maria had been on the road for hours, driving through the endless plains of Nebraska. It was late, and exhaustion weighed heavily on her. She needed a place to rest, but the vast emptiness stretched out in all directions, with no sign of civilization in sight. Just as her eyes began to droop, she spotted a small sign illuminated by her headlights. Rest Haven Motel. Vacancy. The building was small and unremarkable, nestled between a couple of scraggly trees. The neon sign buzzed quietly, its light casting a sickly yellow hue over the cracked pavement. It wasn't ideal, but Maria was too tired to care. She pulled into the parking lot, grabbed her bag, and headed inside. The lobby was dimly lit, with an old desk and a few worn chairs. Behind the counter stood a woman who appeared to be in her late fifties, with deep-set eyes and graying hair tied back in a bun. She greeted Maria with a thin smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. Need a room for the night? The woman asked, her voice raspy as if she hadn't used it in a while. Yes, please, Maria replied, stifling a yawn. The woman reached under the counter and pulled out a key attached to a faded tag with the number 9. You're in room 9. It's at the end of the hall. Checkout's at 10 a.m. Maria thanked her and took the key, eager to get some sleep. The hallway was narrow, lined with dull, beige wallpaper that looked like it hadn't been updated in decades. As she reached room 9, she noticed something peculiar, a large, ornate mirror hanging on the wall beside the door. It was out of place in the otherwise drab surroundings, its gilded frame shining like new. Shrugging off the oddity, Maria unlocked the door and stepped into her room. It was small and sparsely furnished, with a bed, a nightstand, and a single chair. The only decoration was another mirror, identical to the one outside, hanging on the wall opposite the bed. It struck her as odd, but she was too tired to give it much thought. She set her bag down, quickly washed up, and collapsed onto the bed. As she lay there, staring up at the ceiling, she couldn't shake the uneasy feeling the mirrors gave her. They seemed too pristine, too deliberate in their placement, but exhaustion soon won out, and she drifted off to sleep. In the middle of the night, Maria awoke with a start. The room was eerily quiet, and a strange sensation of being watched prickled at the back of her neck. She sat up, her eyes adjusting to the darkness, and noticed something was off. The mirror on the wall wasn't reflecting the room as it should. Instead of showing her the bed and the chair, the mirror depicted a dimly lit hallway, a hallway that looked exactly like the one outside her room. Her heart began to race as she stared at the reflection, trying to make sense of what she was seeing. Then, movement caught her eye. A figure was slowly walking down the hallway in the mirror, its form blurry and indistinct. It moved closer, step by step, until it stopped right in front of the mirror. Maria's breath hitched in her throat. The figure stood there, motionless, as if staring directly at her through the glass. She jumped out of bed, her pulse pounding in her ears, and backed away from the mirror. What the hell was going on? The figure in the mirror began to move again, uh, but this time it wasn't following the hallway outside. It was coming through the mirror itself. 
The surface of the glass rippled like water as the figure stepped through, its form solidifying into a tall, gaunt man with hollow eyes and a wide, unsettling grin. Maria's mind screamed at her to run, but her legs refused to move. The man took another step forward, his grin growing wider. Welcome to the mirror room, he said, his voice a low, haunting whisper. Maria bolted for the door, her hands fumbling with the lock. She could hear the man's footsteps behind her, slow and deliberate, as if he knew she had nowhere to go. Finally, the door burst open and she sprinted down the hallway, her breath coming in panicked gasps. But as she ran, she realized something horrifying. The hallway stretched on infinitely, the doors to the other rooms vanishing into darkness. No matter how far she ran, the end never came. She glanced back and saw the man calmly walking behind her, the same sickening grin on his face. In her desperation, she slammed her hand against one of the walls, hoping to find a hidden door, an exit, anything. But the walls were solid, cold, and unyielding. Tears streamed down her face as she realized the awful truth. She was trapped. Back in room nine, the mirror shimmered, the surface rippling like water once more. Slowly, the figure of Maria emerged, her face twisted in terror. She stared out from the mirror, her eyes pleading, her hands pressed against the glass as if trying to break free. But it was too late. The mirror had claimed her, just as it had claimed so many before. On the other side of the glass, in that endless hallway, the man continued to grin, watching his new prisoner with satisfaction. The next morning, the motel owner, Mrs. Hargrove, shuffled down the hallway, carrying fresh towels. She stopped in front of room nine and knocked, but there was no answer. After a few moments, she unlocked the door and peeked inside. The room was empty, save for the neatly made bed and the mirror on the wall. Mrs. Hargrove smiled faintly as she noticed something new a faint outline of a woman's handprint on the glass. She shook her head, muttering to herself as she left the room and closed the door behind her. Outside in the lobby, a young man was waiting at the counter, looking for a place to stay for the night. Do you have any rooms available? He asked, glancing around the shabby lobby. Mrs. Hargrove smiled that thin, knowing smile. Just one, she said, reaching for the key to room nine. nine. Title The Last Vacancy. Jake and Emily had been driving for hours through the winding back roads of West Virginia, searching for a place to stay. Their GPS had failed them, leading them deeper into the dense, unfamiliar woods as the night grew darker and the roads narrower. It was supposed to be a weekend getaway, a spontaneous adventure to escape the stress of city life. But now, with the car's gas tank dipping dangerously low and no cell service, it felt more like a nightmare. Finally, just when they were starting to lose hope, Emily spotted a small, dimly lit sign by the side of the road. The Silver Pine Motel, it read in faded letters. The building itself was barely visible, hidden behind a thick cluster of trees. Jake hesitated, sensing something off about the place, but they were too exhausted to keep driving. Let's just check it out, Emily urged, her voice tinged with desperation. We need to rest, and we don't have many options. Reluctantly, Jake turned the car onto the narrow gravel driveway, the tires crunching over the stones. The motel was a single-story, U-shaped structure with a small office at the front. A few dim lights flickered above the doors of the rooms, casting long shadows across the cracked pavement. Only a couple of cars were parked in the lot, their owners nowhere to be seen. Jake and Emily got out of the car, stretching their stiff legs as they walked toward the office. The air was thick with the scent of pine and something else, something they couldn't quite place, a faint, acrid smell that lingered just beneath the surface. Inside the office, a bell chimed as they entered. The room was dimly lit, the walls lined with dusty old photos and deer antlers. Behind the counter sat an elderly man, his skin leathery and worn like an old baseball glove. He looked up at them with cold, gray eyes that seemed to pierce right through them. Evening. The man greeted them in a voice as rough as gravel. Need a room? Yes, please, Jake replied, trying to sound polite despite the unease gnawing at him. The old man nodded slowly, reaching under the counter and pulling out a large tarnished key attached to a wooden tag. The number six was carved into the tag, the edges worn smooth from years of handling. Room six, the man said, sliding the key across the counter. Last one available, Emily forced a smile. Thank you. The man's eyes narrowed slightly as he regarded them. 
You folks be careful now, he said, his voice low and cryptic. Don't go wandering around too much at night. Jake nodded awkwardly, taking the key. We won't. Thanks. They quickly left the office, the door creaking shut behind them. As they walked toward room six, they couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The shadows seemed to move with them, light shifting and twisting in the dim light. The room itself was basic but clean. A double bed with a faded floral bedspread, a small dresser with an old TV on top, and a single window covered by heavy, mustard-colored curtains. The bathroom door was slightly ajar, revealing a cracked mirror above the sink. Jake set their bags down and locked the door, securing the chain for good measure. This place gives me the creeps, he admitted, glancing around uneasily. Me too, Emily agreed, her voice barely above a whisper. But we're here now. Let's just get some rest and leave first thing in the morning. They both changed into their pajamas, too tired to do much else. As Emily climbed into bed, Jake turned off the light and joined her. The room was plunged into darkness, save for the faint glow of the old neon sign outside, seeping in through the gaps in the curtains. Emily was the first to drift off, her breathing steady and calm, but Jake lay awake, staring at the ceiling, his mind racing. He couldn't shake the old man's warning or the strange vibe that seemed to hang in the air like a dense fog. Just as he was starting to doze off, a soft noise startled him awake. It was a faint scratching sound, like nails dragging across wood. Jake held his breath, listening intently. The noise continued, growing louder, coming from the direction of the door. His heart pounded in his chest as he slowly sat up, careful not to wake Emily. The scratching was persistent, rhythmic, as if something or someone was trying to get in. He strained his ears, trying to determine if it was an animal or something else. Suddenly, the scratching stopped, replaced by a low, rasping whisper. It was impossible to make out the words, but the tone was unmistakable, malevolent, angry. Jake's blood ran cold as he heard it again, louder this time, almost right outside the door. He reached over to wake Emily, but before he could, a loud bang echoed through the room as if something had slammed against the door. Emily shot up in bed, her eyes wide with fear. What was that? She whispered, clutching the blanket. Shh, Jake, Jake cautioned, holding a finger to his lips. The banging continued, growing more frantic, the door rattling on its hinges. Without thinking, Jake reached for his phone, but there was no signal. Panic set in as he realized they were completely cut off. The banging stopped abruptly, and the room fell into an eerie silence. They sat frozen, barely breathing, waiting for whatever was out there to make its next move. Then, slowly, the doorknob began to turn. It twisted back and forth as if someone were trying to force it open. Jake's heart pounded in his ears as he watched, unable to move, his mind screaming for him to do something. Finally, the doorknob stopped moving, and for a brief moment, everything was still. Then, with a deafening crash, the door burst open, slamming against the wall. The room was plunged into chaos as the shadows seemed to come alive, swirling and writhing like a living nightmare. Jake grabbed Emily's hand and yanked her out of bed, pulling her toward the bathroom. They slammed the door shut behind them, locking it as they pressed their backs against the wall, trying to make themselves as small as possible. The shadows seeped through the cracks in the door, crawling across the floor, reaching for them. The whispering grew louder, more insistent, filling the room with a suffocating sense of dread. Jake and Emily clung to each other, their eyes wide with terror, knowing there was no escape. Just as the shadows closed in, the door to the bathroom flew open, and the old man from the office stood there, his face twisted in a snarl. He raised a gnarled hand, and the shadows recoiled, retreating back through the door as if pulled by some unseen force. Get out! The old man shouted, his voice booming with authority. Get out now, before it's too late. Jake and Emily didn't need to be told twice. They bolted from the bathroom, their feet barely touching the ground as they ran for the car. The old man followed close behind, slamming the motel room door shut as they scrambled into the vehicle. Jake fumbled with the keys, his hands shaking, but finally managed to start the engine. They sped out of the parking lot, gravel spraying behind them as they tore down the narrow road, not daring to look back. It wasn't until they were miles away, the lights of the Silver Pine Motel long behind them, that they finally began to calm down. Their breathing slowed and the tension started to ease from their bodies. What the hell was that? 
Emily asked, her voice trembling. I don't know, Jake replied, his knuckles white as he gripped the steering wheel, but I'm glad we got out when we did. They drove in silence for a while, the adrenaline still coursing through their veins. Finally, they saw a small town in the distance, the warm glow of streetlights a welcome sight. Let's find a real hotel, Emily said, her voice barely above a whisper. Jake nodded in agreement. They needed to be around people, in the safety of civilization, far away from whatever haunted the Silver Pine Motel. Back at the motel, the old man watched as the last vacancy light flickered off. He sighed, his expression grim, and slowly walked back to the office. The room was empty now, the shadows gone, but the unease lingered in the air. He knew it was only a matter of time before the next travelers stumbled upon the Silver Pine Motel, and he knew he would be there, waiting, to warn them. But not everyone would be as lucky as Jake and Emily. Some guests never left. Title, The Forgotten Cabin Beth and Mark had been planning their anniversary trip for months. They both needed a break from their busy lives, and a weekend getaway in the mountains seemed like the perfect escape. Beth had found a cozy cabin online, nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains, far away from the noise and stress of the city. The pictures showed a quaint wooden structure, surrounded by towering trees, with a small creek running nearby. It seemed like paradise. As they drove up the winding mountain roads, the scenery became more and more breathtaking. The dense forest was alive with the vibrant colors of fall, the leaves a kaleidoscope of reds, oranges, and yellows. The GPS directed them further and further into the wilderness, until finally it led them down a narrow gravel path that ended at the cabin. The cabin was exactly as it appeared in the photos, rustic and charming, with a stone chimney that promised warm fires on cold nights. But as Beth and Mark stepped out of the car, an uneasy feeling settled over them. The woods were silent, too silent, as if the very trees were holding their breath. Looks like we're really off the grid, Mark joked, trying to shake off the eerie atmosphere. Beth forced a smile, not wanting to dampen the mood. Yeah, it's perfect, just what we needed. They unpacked their bags and brought them inside. The cabin's interior was cozy, with wooden beams, a stone fireplace, and old-fashioned furniture. There was no TV, no Wi-Fi, and only minimal cell service, exactly what they had wanted. A break from everything. As the sun began to set, Mark went outside to gather some firewood while Beth explored the cabin. She found a small bookshelf filled with dusty old books, a few board games, and a large, ornate mirror hanging on the wall above the fireplace. The mirror's frame was intricately carved with strange symbols and figures. The wood darkened with age. It seemed out of place, too grand for such a modest cabin. Beth was drawn to the mirror, running her fingers over the carvings. There was something about it that made her uneasy, but she couldn't quite put her finger on why. Shaking off the feeling, she joined Mark outside where he had already started a fire in the fire pit. Um, they spent the evening roasting marshmallows, drinking wine, and enjoying the crisp mountain air. But as the night grew darker, the unease that had been lurking at the back of Beth's mind began to grow stronger. The forest around them seemed to close in, the darkness thick and impenetrable. After a while, they retreated inside to warm up by the fire. Mark threw a few logs into the fireplace, and soon the cabin was filled with the comforting crackle of burning wood. They curled up on the couch together, watching the flames dance. But Beth couldn't relax. Her eyes kept drifting back to the mirror above the fireplace. In the flickering firelight, the carvings on the frame seemed to shift and move, almost as if they were alive. Hey, are you okay? Mark asked, noticing her distraction. Beth nodded, forcing a smile. Yeah, I'm fine. Just tired, I guess. Let's get some sleep, Mark suggested, yawning. We've got a big day of hiking tomorrow. They extinguished the fire and headed to the bedroom, a small but comfortable space with a large wooden bed. As Beth lay down, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. The cabin was too quiet, the air too still. Sometime in the middle of the night, Beth was jolted awake by a noise. It was faint but unmistakable, the sound of footsteps on the wooden floorboards. She sat up, her heart pounding in her chest, and strained to listen. The footsteps were slow and deliberate, moving through the cabin. Mark, she whispered, shaking him awake. Hmm, what's wrong? He mumbled, still half asleep. 
Someone's in the cabin, she hissed, her voice trembling. Mark was fully awake now. He sat up and listened, his eyes wide with fear. The footsteps continued, now coming closer to their bedroom door. Mark quietly slipped out of bed and grabbed the heavy flashlight from his backpack. He motioned for Beth to stay put as he crept toward the door. Beth's heart raced as she watched him, every nerve in her body on edge. The footsteps stopped just outside the door. For a moment, there was silence. Then, slowly, the doorknob began to turn. Mark flung the door open, brandishing the flashlight like a weapon, but there was no one there. The hallway was empty, the cabin eerily silent. What the hell? Mark whispered, his voice shaking. He stepped into the hallway, shining the flashlight around, but there was no sign of an intruder. The front door was locked, the windows were closed. There was no way anyone could have gotten in. But the footsteps had been real. Beth was sure of it. Mark checked every room, every corner of the cabin, but, but found nothing. Reluctantly, they both returned to bed, though sleep did not come easily. The silence of the cabin now felt oppressive, the darkness around them filled with unseen threats. The next morning, the unease from the night before had not dissipated. Beth and Mark decided to go for a hike to clear their minds. They packed a lunch and set out into the woods, following a trail that wound through the trees and along the creek. But the further they walked, the more it felt as though they were being watched. The birds were silent, and the forest seemed to hold a heavy, unnatural stillness. After a couple of hours, they stumbled upon something unexpected. A second cabin, hidden deep in the woods, almost identical to the one they were staying in. It was weathered and overgrown, with vines crawling up the walls and the roof sagging in places. Did the rental listing mention anything about another cabin? Beth asked, frowning. Mark shook his head. No, this is weird. Let's check it out. They approached cautiously, their footsteps crunching on the dry leaves. The door was slightly ajar, hanging crookedly on its hinges. Inside, the cabin was a mirror image of their own, though it was in a state of disrepair. The furniture was old and covered in dust, the air stale and musty. As they explored, Beth's eyes were drawn to a familiar sight, a large mirror hanging above the fireplace, identical to the one in their cabin. The same intricate carvings adorned its frame, but this mirror was cracked, the glass fogged with age. Something's not right about this place. Beth whispered, her voice barely audible. We should go. But as they turned to leave, something in the mirror caught her eye. A movement, fleeting but unmistakable. She froze, staring at the reflection. In the cracked glass, she saw not just her own reflection, but that of another figure standing behind her. A tall, shadowy figure with hollow eyes and a twisted smile. Mark, she choked out, her voice trembling. There's someone. Before she could finish, the door slammed shut with a deafening bang. The cabin was plunged into darkness as the sunlight was blotted out by thick, swirling shadows. The temperature dropped and the air became heavy, suffocating. The shadowy figure stepped out of the mirror, its form solidifying into a tall, gaunt man dressed in old, tattered clothes. His eyes were hollow, empty pits of darkness, and his smile was wide, too wide, stretching across his face in a grotesque mockery of joy. Mark grabbed Beth's hand, pulling her toward the door, but it wouldn't budge. The man moved closer, his bony fingers reaching out as if to grab them. Get away from us, Mark shouted, pounding on the door with all his strength. But the man continued to advance, his movements slow and deliberate as if savoring the fear that radiated from them. Beth's heart raced as she frantically searched for another way out, her eyes darting around the room. In desperation, she grabbed a heavy iron poker from beside the fireplace and swung it at the mirror. The glass shattered with a deafening crash, shards flying everywhere. The man let out an inhuman shriek, a sound that sent chills down their spines. As the mirror shattered, the shadows receded, and the man's form began to dissolve into the air, like smoke dissipating in the wind. The oppressive atmosphere lifted, and the sunlight returned, flooding the cabin with light. The door suddenly flew open, and Beth and Mark bolted out, not stopping until they were far away from the cabin. They didn't speak as they ran, their breaths coming in ragged gasps, the terror still fresh in their minds. They didn't stop running until they reached their own cabin. Without a word, they grabbed their belongings, threw them into the car, and drove away, not daring to look back. 
As they sped down the mountain road, Beth glanced in the rearview mirror one last time. For a fleeting moment, she saw the man standing at the edge of the forest, watching them with that same twisted smile. They never spoke of the cabin again, and they never returned to the mountains. But sometimes, late at night, Beth would wake up in a cold sweat, convinced she heard the sound of footsteps on the floorboards slowly making their way toward her. And she would lie there, wide awake, praying that she would never see that twisted smile again. The Room with No Number The Welcome Inn was an old, weather-beaten motel on the outskirts of a small town, far from the hustle of the city. To most, it was an unremarkable place, cracked paint, peeling wallpaper, and the hum of a flickering neon sign that barely illuminated its name. But for the travelers who stayed there, it was more than just a stopover. It was a place that became an unsettling chapter in their lives. Lena had driven for hours, her only company the unending road and the occasional gust of wind that rattled the windows of her old sedan. She was exhausted, her eyes burning from the long drive. As night fell, she decided to stop at the Welcome Inn, hoping to find a clean room and a few hours of rest. The lobby was dimly lit, its old-fashioned decor struggling to hide decades of neglect. An elderly woman stood behind the counter, her eyes sharp despite her frail appearance. She greeted Lena with a nod and a thin-lipped smile that seemed more like a grimace. Checking in, the woman asked in a voice that crackled like old radio static. Yes, just for the night, Lena replied, trying to ignore the shiver running down her spine. The woman handed Lena a key. Room 12. It's at the end of the hall. As Lena made her way to the room, she noticed an oddity. One door, directly across from room 12, had no number. It was just a plain wooden door, its surface marred with deep scratches, like something had tried to claw its way out. She dismissed it as a quirk of the motel's age and unlocked room 12. Inside, the room was as she had expected, basic but clean. The bed was made, the curtains drawn, and a faint, musty smell lingered in the air. She settled in, her exhaustion quickly overcoming her. In the middle of the night, Lena was jolted awake by a loud noise. It was a scraping sound, like metal against wood. Disoriented, she listened intently, her heart racing. The noise was coming from the hallway. Reluctantly, she got out of bed and peeked through the peephole, but saw nothing. The hallway was empty, only the dim light from the end illuminating a stretch of old, worn carpet. The noise had stopped, and feeling uneasy but too tired to investigate further, Lena went back to bed. However, sleep eluded her. Her mind was plagued by thoughts of the door with no number. Hours passed before Lena heard the sound again, this time more distinct. A scratching, accompanied by a muffled thud. Curiosity and fear combined to push her out of bed. She crept to the door and, with trembling hands, unlocked it. The hallway was silent, but she couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. Drawn by a mixture of dread and intrigue, Lena approached the door with no number. The scratches on it seemed fresh, as if something or someone had recently tried to break through. Um, summoning her courage, she turned the handle. The door creaked open, revealing a pitch-black room. The darkness was absolute, and as Lena fumbled for a light switch, she realized with growing horror that there were no light fixtures inside. The air was cold and stagnant, sending a chill through her bones. She took a step forward, her foot meeting something soft and yielding. An old mattress covered in what looked like stains and torn fabric. Her flashlight beam cut through the darkness, illuminating disturbing scenes painted on the walls, crude drawings of grotesque faces and anguished figures. The room seemed to pulse with an eerie energy, and Lena felt a presence, an intangible, suffocating weight that pressed against her. As she backed away, her foot caught on something. She looked down and saw an old, dusty diary. The cover was worn, and the pages were yellowed with age. Curiosity won over fear, and Lena opened it. The entries were scrawled in a frantic hand, recounting disturbing events. A man who had checked in years ago, claiming to hear scratching at his door. A man who had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. And the diary's last entry, pleas for help, written in a shaky hand before abruptly ending. A cold gust of wind blew through the room, extinguishing Lena's flashlight. She fumbled in the darkness, her breathing shallow and quick. Then she heard it, the unmistakable sound of scratching, growing louder, coming from behind her. 
Lena turned to see a shadowy figure emerging from the darkness. Its eyes glowed with a malevolent light, and its mouth was twisted into a silent scream. Panicking, Lena sprinted back to her room, slamming the door behind her. She locked it, her heart pounding so hard she thought it might burst. She stared at the door with no number, feeling its ominous presence even through the thick wall. The next morning, Lena checked out before dawn. She couldn't bear to stay another minute. As she drove away from the Welcome Inn, she glanced back at the motel. To her surprise, the door with no number was gone, replaced by a blank wall. The motel looked as if it had been freshly painted, as though the door had never existed. Weeks later, Lena saw a news report about a series of unexplained disappearances tied to various motels. The Welcome Inn was mentioned as a site of several incidents, with the latest involving a missing person who had checked into Room 12. The report ended with a chilling note. The motel had been closed for renovations. However, a maintenance worker had made a troubling discovery during the renovations. Behind a newly installed wall, there had been a hidden door with no number covered in scratches. And inside that hidden room, they found an old diary, its pages filled with the same frantic scrawls Lena had read. As Lena watched the news, she realized with a shiver that she had unknowingly stayed in the room next to the one where the real horror had been contained. And the true terror was not just what was behind the door with no number, but the fact that the room and the evil within had been moving, following those who ventured too close. The Welcome Inn had always been a place of horrors, but Lena had been the one who discovered the truth. The, truth. the Roach Motel. Tanya pulled into the lot of the Roach Motel just as twilight gave way to night. The neon sign, flickering sporadically, barely illuminated the peeling paint and cracked pavement. She'd been driving for hours, and the last thing she wanted was to keep going. Besides, it was cheap, and with her last few dollars, she couldn't afford to be picky. The motel was the kind you only saw in movies. It's single-story rooms lined up in a row, each with a window covered in grime. Tanya trudged to the check-in desk, which was nestled under an awning. The clerk, a wiry man with a stubbly beard, looked up from his newspaper as she approached. His eyes, though tired, were sharp, and Tanya noticed a thin scar running along his left cheek. Evening, he said gruffly. Need a room? Just for tonight, Tanya replied, handing over her credit card. I'm on a tight budget. He took the card with a nod and tapped away at the old computer. Room 12. Don't expect any luxuries. The heater's broken and the shower's temperamental, but you'll be safe enough. He slid her the key, which was attached to a faded red keychain. Tanya took it and headed toward room 12, her footsteps echoing in the chilly night. The room was everything she'd feared. Dank carpet, stained walls, and a bed that looked like it hadn't been cleaned in months. But it was a place to sleep, and at this point, that's all she needed. As she unpacked a few things, she noticed a strange smell, a mixture of mildew and something she couldn't quite place. It made her stomach churn. She tried to ignore it, setting up her laptop on the rickety desk and attempting to distract herself with work. Hours passed, and fatigue began to set in. Tanya decided to try and get some rest. The bed was uncomfortable, and every little sound, the hum of the old air conditioner, the occasional creak of the walls, seemed amplified in the silence of the night. Just as she was about to drift off, she heard a noise from the adjacent room. It was a low, guttural sound like someone groaning in pain. Her heart skipped a beat. She tried to convince herself it was just the pipes or the wind outside. The noise grew louder, more frantic. Tanya's curiosity got the better of her, and she decided to investigate. She grabbed her phone for light and quietly walked to the thin wall separating her room from the next. Pressing her ear against it, she could make out muffled voices and odd thumping noises. She moved to the small window that faced the parking lot, trying to see if anything was amiss. That's when she saw a shadowy figure moving near the room next door, room 11. The figure seemed to be pacing back and forth, occasionally stopping to glance toward the motel office. Tanya's unease turned to dread. She thought about calling the police but hesitated, unsure if she was overreacting. Instead, she decided to wait and watch. A few minutes later, the shadowy figure vanished and the noises next door ceased. Tanya felt a surge of relief, though it was quickly replaced by a gnawing anxiety. What had she just witnessed? 
Unable to sleep, she paced the room, her mind racing. The strange noises and the figure had unsettled her deeply. As she was about to give up and try to sleep, she noticed something odd. A small, yellowed piece of paper slipped under the door of room 11. Curiosity got the better of her, and she carefully pulled it inside. The paper was covered in scribbles, written in a frantic scrawl. They know. They watch. They listen. Her heart raced as she reread the note. The words were unnervingly cryptic, and a sense of impending doom settled over her. She glanced at her phone. 2 a.m. It was too late to go anywhere, but she couldn't stay here. She had to leave. As she packed her things, a sudden knock at the door made her jump. The sound was sharp, insistent. Tanya's breath came in quick gasps. She peered through the peephole but saw nothing but darkness. Another knock, louder this time. Tanya backed away, her mind racing. Who could it be at this hour? She debated whether to call the police again but decided against it. The last thing she wanted was to draw attention to herself. The knocks continued, punctuated by a low, unsettling chuckle that seemed to come from just outside the door. Tanya's skin crawled. Summoning all her courage, she threw open the door, but the hallway was empty. She quickly grabbed her bags and headed to her car. As she approached it, she noticed something odd, a trail of dirty footprints leading from her car to the office and back. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end. Someone had been watching her. Just as she was about to get into her car, the office door creaked open, and the clerk from earlier stepped out. His eyes were dark and hollow. You're leaving? He asked, his voice almost a whisper. Yes, I need to get out of here, Tanya said, trying to keep her voice steady. The clerk's gaze was unsettling. You should have listened. The rooms here aren't just old. They hold memories, things you can't escape. Once you're here, it never really lets you go. Before Tanya could respond, the clerk closed the door, leaving her alone in the parking lot. She scrambled into her car and sped away, not looking back. As she drove into the night, she felt a wave of relief wash over her. She'd made it out. She was safe. But as the miles passed and she began to calm down, she noticed something strange on her rearview mirror. A small scrawled note, identical to the one she'd found under room 11's door. The words were clear and chilling. We're always watching. Tanya's hands trembled on the steering wheel. The Roach Motel was behind her, but the feeling of being watched was something she couldn't shake. No matter how far she drove, she couldn't escape the sense that someone or something was still keeping an eye on her. The final checkout. Sarah stumbled into the parking lot of the Hollow Creek Motel, exhausted from her road trip. It had been a grueling day, and when she spotted the flickering neon sign, she was relieved to find a place to rest. The motel had an eerie charm with its vintage sign and dim orange lighting. It looked like something out of a 1970s horror movie, but she was too tired to care. Inside the lobby, the check-in desk was manned by a middle-aged woman with a stern face and silver hair pulled into a tight bun. The air was thick with the smell of stale coffee and something else she couldn't quite place. Evening, the woman said, barely looking up from her ledger. We have a room available. It's $50 a night. Sarah handed over her credit card and took the key. Room 8 just for tonight. The woman's eyes met Sarah's for a brief moment, her gaze colder than the night air. The checkout time is at noon. Don't be late. Sarah nodded, trying to brush off the unsettling feeling that was creeping up her spine. She headed down the dimly lit corridor to her room, which was situated at the very end. Room eight was small but functional. The bed was neatly made and the old-fashioned television was off. The air was musty, but it was a far cry from the discomfort of sleeping in her car. She set her bags down and decided to take a quick shower before bed. As she turned on the water, she noticed that the bathroom door didn't have a lock. An odd choice, but again, she was too tired to care. She let the warm water wash away the grime of the road, but the feeling of unease persisted. After the shower, she settled into bed with a book, trying to relax. The room was silent except for the occasional creak of the old building. The clock on the nightstand ticked loudly, each second stretching into what felt like hours. At some point, Sarah's eyes grew heavy and she drifted off to sleep, but she was jolted awake by a sudden noise, a thumping sound coming from the room next door, room seven. It was rhythmic, almost like someone was pacing back and forth. 
She tried to ignore it, but the sound continued, growing louder and more erratic. Unable to take it any longer, Sarah decided to investigate. She slipped on her shoes and quietly opened her door. The hallway was dim, lit only by a few flickering bulbs. She approached room 7 and noticed that the door was slightly ajar. Peering inside, she saw nothing but darkness. The thumping had stopped. She was about to turn away when a figure appeared at the end of the hallway, moving toward her. It was a man, dressed in an old, worn-out uniform that looked strangely out of place. His eyes locked onto hers, and he stopped abruptly. "'Can I help you?' he asked in a low, gruff voice. "'I heard noises coming from this room,' Sarah said, trying to keep her voice steady. "'Is everything all right?' The man's expression didn't change. Everything is fine, just some old pipes and a leaky faucet. You should go back to your room. Something about his demeanor was unsettling. Sarah didn't like the way he stared at her, as if he were assessing her very soul. All right, I'll go, she said, feeling a chill run down her spine. As she turned to head back to her room, she noticed a small handwritten note pinned to the wall by the exit. The writing was smeared, almost like someone had scribbled it in a hurry. Don't stay past midnight. Sarah's heart raced. She felt a wave of anxiety wash over her. She hurried back to her room and locked the door, although it did little to ease her fear. She sat on the edge of the bed, wide awake, waiting for something, anything to happen. The thumping resumed, louder and more insistent than before. It was now accompanied by muffled voices, pleading and desperate. Sarah's mind raced. Was someone in trouble? Should she call the police? Before she could make a decision, the power in the motel flickered and went out, plunging the entire building into darkness. Her heart pounded in her chest as she fumbled for her phone to use as a flashlight. The room was eerily silent now, except for the occasional creak of the building settling. Sarah crept to the door when peeking out into the hallway. The figure from earlier was nowhere to be seen. The corridor was empty and silent, save for the soft rustling of papers and the distant drip of water. A loud crash came from the room next door. Without thinking, Sarah dashed toward the sound, her phone casting an unsteady light in front of her. As she reached room 7, she saw the door wide open. Inside, the room was a mess. Furniture overturned, drawers open, and emptied. On the floor, in the center of the chaos, was a strange old-fashioned hotel ledger. The pages opened to a specific entry. The date was current, but the names listed were not familiar. Most of them were crossed out, but one entry was circled repeatedly. Sarah Miller checked in August 28, 2024. A shiver ran down Sarah's spine. She realized that the name was hers, but she hadn't checked in under her full name. She used just Sarah. As she turned to leave, she heard the door creak behind her. She spun around to see the stern-faced woman from the lobby standing there. The woman's expression was vacant, her eyes empty voids. Leaving so soon? The woman asked, her voice echoing oddly in the empty room. Sarah tried to speak, but found herself unable to form words. The woman's presence was suffocating, and the room seemed to close in around her. Suddenly, the lights flickered back on, and the power returned. The woman was gone, leaving Sarah alone with the ledger. With trembling hands, Sarah fled back to her room, packed her things, and made her way to the front desk. The clerk's expression was unreadable as he handed her the receipt for her stay. Did you enjoy your stay? He asked, almost too casually. Sarah couldn't get out of there fast enough. As she drove away from the Hollow Creek Motel, she looked in the rearview mirror and saw, for a fleeting moment, the image of the stern-faced woman standing in the doorway watching her leave. Sarah never returned to that motel. No one else ever did, either. The Hollow Creek Motel was found abandoned a few months later, its only occupants the echoes of the past and the lingering shadows of those who had checked out, but never truly left. The Midnight Reservation Michael was running late. The road had been long and treacherous, and the GPS had betrayed him with its misleading directions. As the sun dipped below the horizon, he was left in the dark with no choice but to find the nearest place to rest. The only option was the Creston Inn, a dilapidated motel perched on the edge of a foggy, desolate highway. The motel looked like it had been frozen in time, its sign flickering erratically. A neon light sputtered above the entrance, casting an eerie glow. With a sigh of relief, Michael pulled into the parking lot and headed for the front desk. 
The building's facade was grimy and the windows were covered in grime. Inside, the lobby smelled of mildew and stale smoke. Behind the desk stood an elderly man with a sharp, hawk-like gaze. He was tall and gaunt, with deep lines etched into his face. Michael could see the weariness in his eyes, as if he'd been waiting for something or someone for a very long time. Evening, Michael said, trying to sound cheerful despite his exhaustion. I need a room for the night. The man eyed him closely before nodding slowly. You're lucky we have a vacancy. Room nine. It's $40 for the night. Cash only. Michael handed over the cash, and the man slid him an old-fashioned key with a brass tag labeled 9. Checkout is at 10 a.m., the man said. Be sure to leave before then. We have special policies. Michael took the key, puzzled by the man's odd tone, but too tired to dwell on it. He made his way to room 9, which was situated at the far end of the motel. The hallway was dimly lit, and the air was musty. The room itself was unremarkable, bare, with worn furniture and a bed that sagged in the middle. Still, it was a place to sleep. As he unpacked, Michael noticed a faint scratching noise coming from the wall behind the bed. It was barely audible, but persistent. He shrugged it off as the settling of the old building and went about his business. Exhausted, he crawled into bed, the sound of the scratching still in the back of his mind. Around midnight, he was jolted awake by a loud bang coming from the adjoining room, room 10. The sound was followed by muffled voices arguing heatedly. Michael lay still, trying to ignore the disturbance, but the noise grew louder and more intense. The voices were angry, shouting incoherent threats and accusations. Unable to take it any longer, Michael got out of bed and went to the door connecting his room to room 10. He placed his ear against it, trying to make out the words. The voices seemed to be coming from both sides of the wall. One side was pleading desperately, while the other was aggressive and threatening. Summoning his courage, Michael knocked on the door of room 10. There was silence for a moment, followed by the sound of shuffling and the door opening slightly. Michael peered into the dimly lit room, but saw nothing but shadows. Is everything all right? He asked, trying to keep his voice steady. No response came, but the scratching noise behind his own bed grew louder almost as if something or someone was trying to get through. Michael turned to go back to his room, but as he did, the door to room 10 slammed shut with a deafening bang. Heart racing, he hurried back to his bed and tried to ignore the pounding of his own heartbeat. The scratching intensified, now accompanied by faint whispers. The room seemed to grow colder, and Michael could see his breath misting in the air. Desperate to escape the growing sense of dread, he decided to leave the room. He grabbed his keys and stepped into the hallway, only to find it eerily empty. The fluorescent lights flickered above, casting long, distorted shadows on the walls. He made his way to the front desk, hoping to get some answers from the old man. The lobby was dark, and the clerk was nowhere to be seen. As he turned to leave, he noticed a small, dusty ledger sitting on the desk. Curiosity got the better of him, and he flipped it open. The ledger was filled with names and dates, but what caught his eye was a single entry on the page dated for the current day. Next to the name Michael Turner was a small note written in neat, precise handwriting. Arrived at 10 p.m., checkout, midnight. Michael's stomach churned. He had been told checkout was at 10 a.m., not midnight. He glanced around the empty lobby and felt a sudden, overwhelming sense of being trapped. Without warning, the front door slammed shut and the lights flickered out. The room was plunged into darkness. Michael fumbled for his phone, like using its light to navigate back to his room. The corridor was silent now, but the oppressive feeling of being watched was palpable. When he reached room 9, the door was slightly ajar. The scratching noise behind the bed had stopped, replaced by an eerie silence. He stepped inside, and the door slammed shut behind him with a resounding thud. The room seemed to close in around him, the temperature dropping rapidly. In the dim light of his phone, Michael noticed something disturbing, paintings on the wall that he hadn't seen before. Each painting depicted a scene of terror and despair with figures trapped in various nightmarish scenarios. The scratching started again, louder this time. Michael turned to see a dark figure emerging from the shadows, its features obscured. The figure's eyes glowed faintly and its presence seemed to absorb all the light around it. Fear paralyzed him. 
The figure advanced slowly, and the whispers grew louder. Michael tried to move, but felt rooted to the spot. The figure's mouth opened, and a chilling, hollow voice echoed through the room. You've stayed past midnight. Now you're one of us. Michael's scream was swallowed by the darkness as the figure enveloped him. The room seemed to dissolve into an abyss of shadows and whispers. The next morning, the Creston Inn was found abandoned, with no sign of the night's events. Room 9 was empty, save for the old ledger on the front desk. The name Michael Turner was crossed out, with a new note added in the same precise handwriting. Did not check out. Reservation confirmed. New occupant. The Creston Inn continued to stand by the highway, its vacancy sign flickering intermittently, a silent sentinel to the horrors that awaited those who dared to stay past midnight. Midnight. The room with no number. A storm raged outside, its fury evident in the howling wind and torrential rain. Mark, drenched and shivering, pulled into the parking lot of the Whispering Pines Motel, desperate for shelter. The motel was a ramshackle building with peeling paint and a flickering neon sign that advertised rooms at a rate that seemed too good to be true. Inside the lobby, the air was thick with the scent of damp wood and mildew. Behind the counter stood a woman in her 60s with a stern face and eyes that seemed to pierce through him. Her gray hair was pulled back into a tight bun, and she wore a faded, floral dress. Evening, Mark said, trying to mask his unease with a polite smile. I need a room for the night. The woman glanced at him with an expression that was both wary and resigned. We have one room left, she said, her voice low and deliberate. Room 13. It's $60. Mark hesitated. Room 13 was an ominous number, but he was too tired to argue. I'll take it. The woman handed him an old-fashioned brass key without a number on it, just a tarnished red tag. Checkout is at 11 a.m., she said. Her gaze fixed on him with an intensity that made him uncomfortable. Be sure to leave by then. Mark took the key and made his way to room 13, which was located at the end of a dimly lit corridor. The hallway seemed to stretch on forever, and the air was unnervingly cold. When he reached the door, he noticed that the number 13 was not on the door itself, but rather painted on the wall above it in faded, peeling letters. Inside, the room was sparsely furnished with a single bed, a wooden dresser, and an old-fashioned television set. The wallpaper was stained and discolored, and a musty smell permeated the air. Mark set his bag down and tried to shake off the cold, but a creeping sense of unease settled over him. He took a hot shower, hoping it would ease his discomfort. As he stepped out of the bathroom, he noticed a strange, faint sound coming from the wall next to the bed. It was a soft, rhythmic tapping, almost like a heartbeat. Mark dismissed it as the building settling and tried to relax. As the night wore on, the storm outside grew more violent. The wind howled and rain battered the window with a relentless intensity. Mark lay in bed, unable to sleep, his mind racing with thoughts of the strange woman and the eerie room. Just after midnight, he was jolted awake by a loud bang. The tapping noise had turned into a full-blown pounding, accompanied by muffled voices that seemed to be coming from inside the walls. Mark's heart raced as he got out of bed and approached the wall, pressing his ear against it to listen. The voices were indistinct, but one voice was clear and filled with anguish. It seemed to be pleading for help. Mark's pulse quickened and he felt a chill run down his spine. He grabbed his phone and used its light to inspect the wall, but saw nothing unusual. The pounding grew louder, more frantic, and the voices more desperate. Mark tried to call the front desk, but the phone line was dead. The storm outside seemed to intensify, adding to the sense of claustrophobic terror. Desperate to find the source of the noise, Mark looked around the room. He noticed a small, dusty painting on the wall opposite the bed. It depicted a stormy night with a lone figure standing in the rain, holding a broken umbrella. There was something unsettling about the figure's empty, hollow eyes. He reached up and carefully removed the painting from the wall. Behind it, he found a hidden compartment with a small, worn box. His hands shook as he opened it, revealing old photographs and documents and all showing the same woman, the woman who had checked him in. The photos were dated decades ago, and in each one, the woman was surrounded by people who looked desperate and terrified. One photograph was particularly disturbing. It showed a group of people standing in front of a motel, the same one he was in, 
with the number 13 clearly visible above the door. The faces of the people in the photo were blank, their eyes hollow and empty. The pounding noise suddenly stopped. The room fell into an eerie silence, broken only by the sound of the storm outside. Mark felt a shiver of dread as he realized that the pounding had ceased precisely at midnight. He replaced the painting and put the box back where he had found it, his mind racing. He had to leave. He grabbed his things and headed for the door, only to find that it was jammed. Panic set in as he tried to force it open, but it wouldn't budge. In his desperation, he looked around the room for another way out. The only other exit was a small window that was too high up to reach. His heart pounded as he realized he was trapped. As he paced the room, he noticed a hidden door behind a loose panel in the wall. With trembling hands, he pried it open and found a narrow staircase leading down into darkness. The air was cold and musty, and the smell of decay was overwhelming. He descended the stairs, hoping to find another exit, but instead he found himself in a dimly lit basement. The walls were lined with old dusty furniture and broken fixtures. At the far end of the room was a door with a brass plaque that read, Room 13, Check Out. His heart raced as he approached the door. He pushed it open, and a rush of cold air greeted him. Inside, the room was a mirror image of his own, but with one stark difference. The walls were covered in desperate, spark, frantic messages scrawled in what looked like dried blood. Mark's breath caught in his throat as he realized that the messages were written by previous occupants of Room 13, trapped and desperate. The final message, scrawled in large, frantic letters, read, Never leave. They watch. Suddenly, the basement lights flickered and went out, plunging the room into darkness. The door slammed shut behind him, and Mark heard the sound of footsteps approaching from behind. He turned around to see the woman from the front desk standing there, her face expressionless and her eyes cold. You should have checked out, she said, her voice echoing eerily in the dark. Now you're part of the collection. Mark's scream was swallowed by the darkness as the woman approached him. The storm outside raged on, a reminder of the world that had been left behind. The Whispering Pines Motel remained, a place where the desperate and the doomed were forever trapped in a, in a room with no number, their souls bound to the darkness within its walls. The Last Guest Emma's car broke down on a deserted stretch of highway as night fell. The storm clouds gathered ominously overhead, and the distant rumble of thunder seemed to echo her frustration. She hadn't seen a gas station or any sign of civilization for miles, so when she finally spotted the crumbling silhouette of the Twilight Inn, she was both relieved and wary. The inn was a decrepit, two-story building with an old-fashioned neon sign that blinked intermittently. The flicker of the sign cast eerie shadows on the cracked pavement. Emma hesitated before heading inside, her damp clothes sticking to her skin. The lobby was dimly lit, and the air was stale with the scent of mildew and old books. Behind the counter stood a tall, wiry man with a gaunt face and hollow eyes. His uniform was neat but faded, and his expression was almost mechanical. Good evening, Emma said, trying to sound cheerful. I need a room for the night. My car broke down, and I don't know when I'll be able to get it fixed. The man's eyes seemed to bore into her as he processed her request. We have one room available, room seven. It's $50 for the night, cash only. Emma handed over the cash, and the man handed her an old-fashioned key with a simple brass tag that read, 7. Checkout is at 10 a.m. sharp, he said, his voice monotone. If you're late, you'll be charged extra. Emma took the key, feeling a shiver of unease as she made her way to room 7. The hallway was dark and narrow, and the flickering lights overhead did little to illuminate the way. When she reached room 7, she found the door slightly ajar. She pushed it open and stepped inside. The room was shabby but functional, a bed with a worn-out mattress, a small wooden desk, and a dusty armchair. The wallpaper was peeling, and the air was musty. Emma set her bag down and took a deep breath, trying to shake off the feeling of dread that seemed to hang in the air. As she settled into bed, she noticed a strange noise, a soft scratching sound coming from the wall. It was intermittent and faint, but it was persistent enough to be unsettling. Emma tried to ignore it, attributing it to the age of the building. She managed to fall asleep, but she was awakened in the middle of the night by a loud bang. Startled, 
She sat up and listened. The sound was coming from the room next door, room six. It was a rhythmic pounding, like someone was banging on the walls or the door. Curiosity got the better of her, and she decided to investigate. She slipped on her coat and quietly left her room, making her way to room six. The door was closed, but the pounding continued, growing louder and more frantic. Emma hesitated before knocking softly. The pounding stopped abruptly, replaced by a chilling silence. Emma waited for a response, but heard nothing. She tried the door handle, and to her surprise, it was unlocked. She pushed the door open slightly and peeked inside. The room was empty, but the furniture was overturned and the bed was in disarray. The air was thick with the scent of mildew, and the room felt colder than it should have been. Emma noticed a single sheet of paper on the floor. She picked it up and saw that it was covered in frantic scribbles. Help us. We're trapped. Her heart raced as she read the note. The room felt oppressive, and the silence was deafening. Emma decided to return to her own room, but as she turned to leave, she heard a low, guttural voice coming from behind her. Why did you leave us? The voice rasped. Emma spun around but saw no one. The door to room six slammed shut, and the temperature in the hallway dropped significantly. The scratching noise from her own room started again, louder this time, accompanied by a whispering sound that seemed to come from all directions. Panicked, Emma rushed back to room seven and locked the door. She tried to call the front desk, but the phone line was dead. The whispers grew louder and the scratching became a frenzied pounding. As she backed away from the door, she noticed a hidden compartment in the wall behind the armchair. Her hands trembling, she pried it open and found a collection of old photographs and documents. The photographs showed people in various states of distress, their faces twisted in fear. Each photo was labeled with dates and names, names that matched previous guests of the Twilight Inn. One document caught her eye. It was a record of guests who had stayed in room seven with detailed notes about their behaviors and the special circumstances of their stay. The last entry, dated just a few days ago, read, Emma Green arrived at 11 p.m. Check out midnight, room seven. See instructions. Emma's breath came in ragged gasps as she realized the implication. The Twilight Inn wasn't just a place to sleep, it was a trap. The guests who had stayed here were marked for something far more sinister. The scratching and pounding intensified, and the whispers turned into anguished cries for help. Emma's panic reached a crescendo. She tried to escape through the window, but it was sealed shut. The door to room seven suddenly flew open, and the wiry man from the front desk stood there, his eyes empty and cold. It's time, he said in a hollow voice. Emma backed away, her mind racing. The man stepped aside, revealing a dark, swirling void where the room should have been. It was a black, shifting mass that seemed to consume all light and sound. No, please, Emma pleaded, but her voice was swallowed by the void. As she was drawn toward the darkness, she felt an icy grip on her arm. She looked down to see ghostly hands reaching out from the void, pulling her into its depths. The whispers grew louder, and the faces from the photographs appeared around her, their eyes filled with eternal despair. The last thing Emma saw was the front desk clerk's vacant gaze as the darkness closed in. The room was silent once more, save for the distant mournful whispers. The next morning, the Twilight Inn was found abandoned, its lights flickering erratically. Room 7 was locked and empty, but the old ledger at the front desk had a new entry. It read, Emma Green, checked out at midnight. Room 7, last guest. The Twilight Inn remained a ghostly monument on the roadside, its vacancy sign flickering as a warning to those who ventured too close. The whispers of its lost souls continued to echo through the empty halls, uh, a reminder of the fate that awaited anyone who stayed at the inn and did not heed the warning to leave before the darkness.